Thank you all for coming out on today, the 4th of October, 1916. Uh, as you may know, we are celebrating our quarter centennial anniversary this year at the university. Um, I am Dr. Thorsten Veblen, professor of political economy here at the University of Chicago. Anywhere along the way, you are invited to ask questions, but I am in no ways obligated to answer them. Former students may recall that last year, my office hours were reputedly Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to 11 and that I then shortened them to Mondays from 10 to 10.10 10 a.m. This story is not true. Those of you who were my students, I think I recognize one there, will recall that my office hours last year were actually Mondays from 10 to 10.05 a.m. At each of the sites that we'll visit, I will tell you briefly about the structure itself, and then I will connect it to some narrative connected to the university. We'll also be hearing from different figures connected to the university, such as the ghost of our very first president, William Rainey Harper, and some of his former students. Thomas W. Goodspeed, along with his associate, um, Frederick Gates, are sort of the tortoise and the hare in the sort of tale of the founding of the university. Goodspeed was very eager to raise funds and get the university off the ground as quickly as possible after the demise of the first University of Chicago. Gates was much more patient and much more willing to negotiate with people in order to get the funds necessary to found the university. And why was he patient? Because not only was he connected to the American um, Baptist Education Society, but he was also a confidant of this man here, the founder of the University of Chicago, John David Rockefeller. Now at the time of the university's founding in the early 1890s, John David Rockefeller was the richest man in the United States, if not the richest man in the world. Uh, he was, of course, the president of the Standard Oil Company. Or what sort of university was being founded here? Well, on one hand, and in terms of educational outlook and methods, it was going to be a very kind of modern institution based on a kind of German model. But in terms of how it conducted its business, it was much more like that of Standard Oil, its benefactor. So now briefly, we will hear from President Harper as he describes his desires for the new University of Chicago. So William Rainey Harper, take it away. Let it be a university made up of a score of colleges with a large degree of uniformity in their management. In other words, an educational trust. That's right. So if we had an oil trust, and a copper trust, and a sugar trust, and a meatpacking trust, now we will have an educational trust. As I said, Harper was very adept at raising money for his new university, but he was even more adept at, at spending it because he had very grand visions. As I said, he wanted this to be a premier institution. And by 1899, it had the fourth largest endowment of any institution of higher learning in the country, trailing only Stanford, John Hopkins, and then Columbia. Um, despite having an enormous endowment, it was also consistently in debt. Cobb was even more brilliant at spending Harper's money. So he produced very ostentatious buildings, elaborately decorated buildings. And so, as you'll observe, a lot of the post-1900 buildings are, are a bit more Spartan, and I'll point that out. So are the buildings here within the Hall Biological Court, which we'll enter in a minute. Harper wanted to create this premier institution, and in order to do that, he wanted to get premier faculty. So he basically went across the country promising people large salaries to lure them away from places like Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Chamberlain, who I just told you about, was president of the University of Wisconsin. Right? He gave up his position as president of the University of Wisconsin to become the head professor of uh, geology here at the university. So it was basically a kind of raid on academia that Harper undertook. Now, Harper just didn't expect a lot of work from his students. He also expected a lot of work from himself. So now we'll hear President Harper tell you about an average day in his life. Uh, this is my daily regime. 6 a.m., arise and drink a cup of coffee. 7.30 a.m., teach in the junior college. 9.30 a.m., answer correspondence and attend to administrative matters. 10.30 a.m., lead chapel services, including the doxology. 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., office hour open to all students. 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m., luncheon at Chicago Club and meet with potential donors in business manager's office, 135 Adams. 4 p.m., teach in the junior college. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., teach graduate seminar. 8.30 p.m., supper with Mrs. Harper and the children. <laughs> 9.30 p.m., retire to study for purposes of scholarship and composition. 12 o'clock a.m., 
coronet practice and light lunch. <laughs> 1 a.m. to bed, having endeavored to use the day to the fullest. Thank you, Dr. Harper.